see them coming now. We can see them coming now. Yeah, 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 yeah. He didn't leave you where he found you. Welcome home. He didn't leave you where he found you. Welcome home. Help me say. That the Lord has kind of lost his way No Crazy as it seems Yeah, I know it's gonna be okay Ooh, yeah It doesn't scare me It's temporary There's something bad We got forever And it won't be long Cause we know our help is on its way Away So keep your head up
Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Let's all stand tonight and go before the Lord with praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Giving God the praise for being in his house tonight. Praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord at his praise shall be in my mouth. Amen. Come on, let's go to the Lord together right now. Precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, how we love you, Lord, how we thank you. Lord, how we worship you and magnify you. Lord, for you and you alone, God, are worthy to be praised, worthy of all the glory and all the honor, God. It all belongs to you. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I praise your name. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, in your precious holy name, we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Turn and greet somebody tonight. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Come on, then let's worship the Lord together tonight.
Hallelujah. Amen. How many knows that place? Praise God. The Bible says he that dwelleth in the secret place. Amen. Under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. How many is glad you found that secret place? Praise the Lord where you can just lean on him. Amen. Trust in him. Praise the Lord and feel the love of God. Can we just love him again for a moment? God, how we love you, Lord. How we thank you, God. How we praise your name. How we praise your name. Lord, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God. Lord, not because of your blessings, not because of all the benefits, God, but because you are our Savior. You, God, the lover of our soul. Oh, I thank you, God. Hallelujah. God, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, right now. We praise your name. We praise your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, how I love you, Lord. How I thank you, Lord. Ah, yes, God. Yes, God. Ah, there's nothing like the love of Jesus. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. There's no love like that love. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Amen. You can see there's a lot of people not here. We need God to move in some situations. Amen. We're going to have special prayer here in just a moment for someone. But uh, we're glad to see all those that are here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, let's pray for those. We have several that are dealing with work issues on Wednesday nights. And I know people have to have a job, and I'm not praying against their job, but we know God can adjust hours so that they can be in the house of the Lord. They tell me, brother, we want to be there, just cannot get there with this job that we've got now or the hours that they've changed me to. So let's pray that God would make a way, that God would adjust it for their good. Amen. Not only for the good of the church, but for their good more than anything. So let's continue uh, to pray for one another, continue to lift one another up. You see many names on the prayer list tonight. If you would, my mom told me on the way to church, remember my dad in prayer. He's not feeling very good last couple of days, so remember him in prayer. Amen. Let's take all unspoken requests by uplifting of the hand. Sister Dolores is here, but remember her. She's sick tonight. Uh, her and Kim are not fighting. Somebody tried to spread that rumor, but yeah, somebody... <laughs> I said, if you listen to Sister Dolores' voice, it sounds like Kim choked her out. She can't talk or anything. So let's remember, let's remember her. Amen. Let's pray that God keep his hand upon. I know we're starting into this uh, holiday season. People are already traveling and doing different things with family. Once again, let's pray that God's light would just shine forth. Amen. Let's be salt. Let's be light. Amen. And let's let God get the glory. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer right now. Precious Heavenly Father. God, we call upon you right now, thanking you, praising you. God, for your goodness and your mercy. God, for you are the lover of our soul. Lord, you are the giver of all things, God, and through you and by you. God, all things are done. Oh, God, how we love you. God, how we praise you and how we magnify you right now. Lord, we know that you see each and every one, Lord, in this house. Those that cannot be here and those that choose not to be here. Lord, we pray for them tonight as well. Oh, the sick, the afflicted, every name on the prayer list tonight. Lord, we know that you see them, God. You know them, Lord. And those that are here tonight, God, sick and afflicted in body, heal them, God, and bring them out, Lord. Oh, I pray. God, those that are troubled in their mind, troubled in their spirit, God, Lord, there is a peace like no other that's in you. Lord God, right now, send peace to those that need it, Lord, and stir those, God. Lord, to remembrance, to know there's one way. Hallelujah. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Hallelujah. God, let us remember, Lord, and let us hold fast, God, to who you are. Lord, and that plan of salvation, Lord, oh, I pray. God, let us speak it into lives, Lord. Oh, yes, God, when they ask, what must we do? Lord, let us share with them, God. Ah, oh, yes, Lord, and help us, God, to live it in front of them more than anything. God, we give you praise. Hallelujah, Lord, yes, God. Falling in love. Falling. 
Hallelujah. Can you testify to that tonight? Falling in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. Another old song says, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to have special prayer tonight. I want to anoint a prayer cloth as we do. I want us to gather around as family and pray for this one young lady that been here several times Darian's friend Portia is in the hospital tonight matter of fact she's been at the point of death the last few days We've had her on life support haven't sent out anything family started putting some things online but you know I tried to be very cautious with that but here taking up prayer request uh, I want to make sure that we pray together as a family tonight um, this time, uh, a night or two ago, they didn't know if she'd make it through the night. And uh, she's doing a little better, a little better this morning. I think that's where the Amoses are tonight. They were going to try and go see her last night. They were going to try to go, and I was going to try to go, and they were running some tests on her and doing a procedure to try to get blood pumping to her heart the right way. Uh, she's having a lot of problems, a lot of issues. This young lady, they said she wasn't supposed to live to be a year old. And now she's 18 years old. And, uh, but I want us to pray for her. Uh, and we're going to pray for some other situations. Uh, but let's pray tonight. Would you gather around and pray for this young lady? Pray for her family. Amen. I want to take this to her. I'm going to try to go up there tomorrow morning before I have to go to work and try to pray with her. And um, just remember, amen, that God would have his way in it. Can be seated tonight for a few minutes. Ah, uh, yes, Lord. Let's continue to pray for one another. Continue to pray that God would just come down and have His way. Amen. That God would move in a mighty way. Don't forget, tonight's not only VBS night, but it's also Youth Alive night. 
Don't forget about that. And I will tell you, this will be the last regular Bible study of the year. Because next Wednesday night, we will not have midweek service. Because I know, again, there's a lot of stuff going on. People are traveling, and we want people to be able to spend time with their family. And uh, we feel that's very important as well. So don't forget about that. Amen. And then don't forget Christmas service is going to be on Christmas Day this year. So come out Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. We will have Sunday school, no afternoon or night service Christmas Christmas Day. Amen. But just one service in the morning. Everybody come out and be a part of that. On Wednesday night, the 28th, we're going to have foot washing and communion because we're not going to have watch night this year. This, the way it's society is right now, the way uh, we've got a lot of elders that never get to partake in foot washing and communion because they don't want to come out that late. Um, and be honest with you, our attendance has dwindled away quite a bit. Sister Kim and I will be gone uh, that weekend. It was the only weekend we can go see Brittany and Ian in Texas, so we're going to be gone. And uh, so we are going to do foot washing and communion on the 28th. So two weeks from tonight will be our foot washing and communion service. And that's not something, that's why you haven't gotten a December calendar. It's something that um, I have been praying about and thinking on for quite a while. And just have talked to several people and seen what their level of interest was. And, and uh, so we're just going to forego watch night this year and see what happens. But... Um, so I hope you're not mad at me, but uh, we we're trying to trying to get it so that more people can come to Foot Washington Communion next week for one thing. And I know several of the elders, Sister Haven used to always ask me, won't you move that up earlier in the night so we can come? And we always tried to have uh, watch night, but this year we are not going to have it. We will have Foot Washington Communion on Wednesday night, the 28th. Amen. So everybody come out for that special Foot Washington Communion. Wednesday night, and that way hopefully more people can come and be involved. I believe it's important. Amen. And so uh, wherever you're at on the 31st, pray the old year out and the new year in. Call some people from the church if you want. Get a prayer chain going. That's all right. Amen. If you want to come here, you can come here and pray if you want. That's all right, too. If you can get in the building, come on in and pray, and that'll be just fine. And because we have announced this, we will not have... Sunday morning on the 1st, but there will be night service on the 1st. So flip-flop from the 25th and the 1st. We'll have Sunday morning on the 25th and no Sunday night. And then we will have Sunday night and no Sunday morning on the 1st. Don't mix it up, all right? Because you'll be the only one here the evening of the 25th. All right. Let's stand. Bring our tithes and offering unto the Lord tonight. Give as the Lord lays it upon your heart. Amen. And cross aisles, greet somebody, and then everybody that's going next door, you'd be dismissed. All right, brother. Let's give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, let's give thanks unto the Lord. For he's been so merciful and good to us all. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe we need to give thanks unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see Brother Caleb back with us tonight. Amen. He had that baby, and well, Jessica had that baby, but we're glad, Brother Caleb. That was a joke, folks. So sorry about that. 
But we're glad to have Brother Caleb back with us. We've been missing him. Amen. He's been sick as well, so we're glad he's feeling better back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter there. We'll take up where we left off down at verse number six. Amen. 1 Timothy, chapter six, verse number six. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we have brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they which be rich fall into temptation, and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I want to stop there for a moment tonight. And that might be as far as we get. I'm not sure. But godliness with contentment is great gain. How many knows we need godliness tonight? Amen. I want to talk to us just a little bit tonight the difference between contentment and being complacent. The title tonight is Peace and Contentment and Destruction in Complacency. There's peace in contentment. Here the Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You say, Brother Riggs, I, I don't think we should be content we need to constantly grow. The Bible says here that we need to be content. What you're talking about is complacent. We cannot sit back and just say, well, what I've got is good enough and I don't need anything else. Amen. But the Bible tells us to be content with the things that we have. And I, I relay this quite often, and I'm going to relay it again tonight. There's so many times that we are striving, Brother Paul, so many times to get somewhere that we're not that we forget to enjoy where we are right now. And I don't believe that's what the Lord wants us to do. I believe that we need to have goals, and we need to reach those goals. But if we spend 25 years of our life trying to get to a goal, and we're never happy one day of those 25 years, and we get to that goal, Sister Pam, and then we realize this isn't make me happy either. This isn't where I wanted to be either. There are so many people today, that verse, what did it say? It says that, but they which be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There are people that think money is going to make them happy. I'll tell you right now, money will not make you happy. I said, money will not make you happy. It's nice to have until it becomes something that you have to have to be happy. It's something that can buy you a lot of stuff, Brother Jerry, until I have to clean out the garage because of all the stuff that I have bought. It can help you make friends until you don't have any money, and then guess what? You don't have any of those friends. Ask the prodigal son. While he had money, he was the life of the party. When the money ran out, I don't read, Sister Debbie, where anybody else went to the hog pen with him. Sound like he was all by himself. People in the world thinks money can buy you happiness. They'll get drunk, they'll get high. Sooner or later, that's going to run out. And that high is not high enough. That downer don't get you mellow enough. 
I heard a guy talking here a while back, and he said, man, we were living on, we were living on speed to stay awake. And then we were so wired when it went time, when it's time to go to bed, we had to take downers to get ourselves to go to sleep. And the world thinks that's a life. But here the Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. How many's trying to gain something tonight? Amen. I'm striving to gain eternal life. How about you? Yes, money is nice. You ever seen money change people? Oh, yeah. You know how many of these lottery winners, Sister Dolores has nothing to show for it in just a very short time because money changes them. I remember there was a story that was told here locally. It was in Indiana. Someone won one of those big lotteries. And I forget what the time frame was. It was less than five years, I think it was, that they were flat broke and they were having to auction off everything that they had. These people were crazy. You know those big claw foot chairs with the lion heads for arms and all of that? I forget, they had like 20 of those chairs. Who needs 20 of those chairs? The same company that auctioned off Sister Angie this family's auction this family's possessions were the same people that did the auction for LS Airs remember LS Airs the tea room and all that stuff downtown the clock with the cherub on it at christmas time and all of that good stuff the same auction company did this for a, a department store did this family's auction and they said this family had more tea services than LS Airs had who drinks that much tea? Not me. People lose their mind. Remember one of the wisest things I heard anybody say about money. There was a couple. They were probably about the age I am now. But it was when the Hoosier Lottery first started. You won a million dollars. Somebody won a million dollars every week on that thing, if you remember when it first started. Everybody, somebody won a million dollars every week. Well, the first few weeks, every week, within just a day or so, somebody was claiming their million dollars. Well, about, I don't know, it was early on into it. I want to say about four or five winners into it. Nobody came forward. And nobody came forward, and nobody came forward. And for about a week or so, someone finally came forward, and it was this middle-aged couple and they asked him, they said, why did you not come forward until now? Why did you wait a week or two weeks or whatever it was to come forward? Brother Jeff, the man said, because we were going to a family reunion and we didn't want anybody to know we'd won a million dollars. I thought, that man is smart. <laughs> Money will change people if they're not careful. But here the Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Go to Luke 12. There's a difference between being content with what you have and being complacent with what you have. See, complacency will destroy, but contentment will make you happy until you move up a little higher and you move up a little higher. How many knows God wants you to be blessed tonight? And he said unto his disciples, Luke 12, 22, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye double-minded, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these. Look at that. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure. What did I just say? God wants you to be blessed. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where neither where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't think God wants us to just sit back and say, I don't have to do anything. I'm a child of God. But I will tell you this. The Bible says he's never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. When it comes down to it, if we put our faith and our trust in God, Amen. How many knows that God is never going to leave you? God's never going to forsake you. Sister Blanche just said it. He's never going to fail you. Amen. Now, I believe we have to do our part, and I believe that God wants us to do our part. But I believe the main thing of our part is putting our trust in him, putting our faith in him. We, that scripture said and to paraphrase it, that are we got our faith in the things of the world or do we have our faith in God? Church, we need to have our faith in God. If you've got a 401k or you've got stock, how much money have you lost in the last year and a half? Sister Kim, something comes in from the 401k, and she's like, we got to change some things. We got to do something. Every time I'm losing money, I started with this, and now I've got that. I'm going to tell you something. We can't put much faith in this world today. Funny money. You got that money in your pocket. Sister Blanche, I was talking to a guy the other day. He came in with paperwork. I, I know you probably get sick of hearing about my job, but it's my job. It's my experience. That's what... I've got to tell you about now. I used to tell you about printing. Now I tell you about headstones. <laughs> Came in the other day with a piece of paper. His parents bought a monument from the same company I worked for back in 1988. Boy, ancient history. 1988, that sounds like forever ago. How many, how many in here feels like that was yesterday? Me. But you think about it, 1988, what was that? That was uh, 34 years ago, is that right? Look at that quick math. 34 years ago, 1988. Walked in with a piece of paper. He said, this was what my mom and dad bought in 1988. I looked at the price. I looked at the size of the monument. First, I looked at the price, and I was like, well, that's not too much different than what? And I looked at the size, and I'm like, oh, that was a really big headstone for that amount of money. So he told, I looked at the amount. Brother Nate, I called the head office. And I said, hey, I need a price quote because I don't even have a price for something that size in my book. I had to call him to get a special quote. I said, hey, I need a quote for this size monument in this color from 1988 to now. It went up $7,000. $7,000. Think about your car. I remember 1978. Woo, we're really talking ancient now. How many feels like that was a couple of days ago? Yeah. My dad and my mom went to buy a brand new car. Brand new car. First new car I think they ever owned as a couple, I think. 1978 Chevy Malibu station wagon. Powder blue. It was a little more than that, brother, but yeah. Dad went in. They had been looking at one. There was one at another dealership for a price that mom and dad wanted to get this one for because one of the other dealership was a green color. Mom didn't want green. She wanted that powder silver blue Malibu station wagon. Dad told him the price. The guy said, ah, we can't, we can't sell it to you for that. And they said, okay, we'll go down to whatever other Shiver Delay dealership it was and We'll go down there and buy that one. They've got one down there. The guy said, well, don't go anywhere. You know, I'll go talk to the manager, blah, blah, blah. Came back. 
said, yeah, we can sell it to you for that price. Dad said, all right. And they pulled, I think it was $6,700 out and laid it on the table, cash, laid it out on the table. That man about fell out of his chair. I was sitting there, I was 10 years old. He about fell out on the floor. He didn't want to take it. He said, I don't know if we can take cash. But what I'm trying to tell you is $6,700 for a brand new car in 1978. What's brand new car run you today? Really? But that's not a station wagon. This was a station wagon. Yeah. How much? All right. So it's $22,000 more. And that's not even the same car. We're talking about a station wagon compared to a sedan. What's a new pickup truck cost today, Brother Jerry? You know? Brand new one? Mid, mid range, not even top of the line. What's it, what is it, Brandon? You're always looking at that stuff. 50 grand for a pickup truck. Remember when a pickup truck used to be the cheap way to get around? Not no more. You pay more for that than you do a Cadillac almost. Top end pickups, what, about 75, 80, 90, 90, 90 grand for a pickup truck. 90 grand. We won't even talk about what them electric batteries are going to cost you. <laughs> you don't want to know. So we got, to, we got to have things. But this, this money, what I was talking about, this money is just funny money. It's just monopoly money. Okay, so you make this much an hour, but look how much everything costs. My grandma used to tell me, Joe, we could go to the store on $10 and buy two weeks of groceries on $10. My grandfather got a $20 bill one time from a guy and said he thought he could retire on $20. That's what he thought. This was probably right before, right during the Depression. Guy gave him 20 bucks, and he said, I thought I could retire. He was cutting hair, and it was a quarter a haircut. And the guy that had some money, I won't say how he got his money, gave him 20 bucks for a 25-cent haircut. And Grandpa said, I thought I could retire on $20. Think about that today. Have you went to fast food lately, Sister Angie? Have you bought anything at the fast food restaurant? Sister Kim and I went the other day. What was it you got? You got us two sandwiches and two drinks. No fries, no, no nothing. Just two sandwiches and two drinks. It was over twenty dollars for two sandwiches. Brother Johnny, I looked down at my breakfast sandwich the other morning. It was almost seven dollars for this bread. I said, "It's just funny money, folks." What are we going to put our trust in? See, I've got a God that never changes. I've got a God, no matter what inflation does, he's the same. Amen? If we go into recession, guess what? My God's still the same. If the money's flowing and everything's going good, my God's still the same. But see, if I put my trust in those things, come on. That, that car from 1978, it's probably been in the junkyard for a long time. But my God is the same now as he was in 1978. Isn't that right? We can't put our trust. We have to be content in the things of God. Not complacent, but be content with what God has given us. Amen. So many times people, what did that say? Contentment with godliness. Amen. There's so, let, me, let me just bring it down, and we're going to talk about pastors here I got to hurry in a moment, amen, because what happens so many times is, and Brother Pedigo and them were saying it when they were here Sunday. I tell you, they were so on point with some things. I told them, I said, you have no idea the things that was going on that you were speaking, right? I thank God when he sends people by that can preach, amen, to our hearts and, and kind of uh, stir some things up within us. I hope he stirred some things up within you, amen, but, but, but I said, you know, there's so much of this where preachers today are, they're not content with uh, the crowd that they've got. And, and I don't mean to be content. I don't mean to be complacent. I mean we need to be content. Amen. I want more to get saved, but I'm glad for the people that are saved. Amen. See what I'm saying? There's a difference. You can have peace when you're content. But destruction will follow you when you become complacent. We don't want to be complacent. Amen. We want more, but if we spend the whole time 
worrying and fretting over the ones that aren't out there, that aren't in here, then sometimes we'll lose the ones that are in here. Come on. We can't let the ones starve to death that are trying to feed while we're trying to drag some in that, that don't want to eat. Amen. I want them to come in. But so many times today, churches are letting down because the pastor's not content. And so we'll let down on godliness, Brother Paul. And instead, we try to have a bigger crowd. And then guess what? We become complacent. Amen. We become complacent with not the things that matter. We'll become complacent with the things of God. We went from being content in God to now we're just complacent to do and to reach to the weak and beggarly elements of the world. But the Bible tells us not to run to those things. One more place, and then before we're going to switch gears just a little bit, go to Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look at that. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Can you say that tonight? The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Once again, who are we putting our trust in? Where is our faith tonight? Amen. Are we relying on our own knowledge and our own wisdom? What does the Bible say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy path. Amen. Here he says, so that may, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Would, would we walk up to the Lord tonight and say, God, I don't need your help? Would you say that to the Lord? God, I don't need your help. I got it all under control. Would we ever say that to the Lord? Okay, let me ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer. But do we live that way? Do we live like I can handle it? You know how many times I've heard people say, well, I'm a control freak and I've got to be in control. Let me tell you something. You're really not in control of very much in your life. It's God that breathes the breath of life into you. It God, it's God that keeps that heart pumping. It's God that keeps that car on the other side of the line. Come on now. When you're spinning out of control on that black ice, let me ask you what kind of control freak you are now because you're completely out of control. And there's a lot of people that live their life on black ice, if you will, out of control all the time. So we may not say to the Lord, I don't need your help, but a lot of times people will live, Lord, I don't need your help. But church, I want to I know that God is my helper, and I want him to know that I need his help. Anybody need his help tonight? For you see, what will happen, there's a couple of places in the Old Testament I want us to go. So go to Jeremiah. You know what's taking place here in Jeremiah? The children of Israel are being carried into captivity because they would not follow the direction of God. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, the 20th verse, he says, My tabernacle is spoiled. And all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me. And they are not, they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. What's he talking about? Remember the tabernacle of the wilderness, the, how they had to set that up. And here he's saying there's no one to worship the Lord anymore. There's no one to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Uh oh. Behold, the noise of the brute is come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen 
that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Why? Why was these things taking place? Because they become complacent with where they were. They become complacent in the things of man and not leaning upon the things of God. And here, because of that, now they were going to be carried away once again into bondage because they had not sought the Lord. It says, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Church, we have got to keep our face before the Lord. We have got to continue to seek the things of God, to seek the help of God, because when we try to do it in our ability, it's going to fail. When we try to do it with our talent, it's never going to work. It has has to be because we are being directed of God. Not complacent with our program. It's not how many coats we can buy, brother and sister Poe, right? It's about how many souls can get saved. It's not about how many backpacks we can give away. It's about how many souls can be saved. There's a lot of preachers want to run around and tell you how many people got the Holy Ghost in their revival, but I want to know when they go back to preach at that church, how many of them are still going to that church. I've baptized more than one person that's told me this, that said, well, I know one in particular told me this directly. He said, I got baptized when I was a kid because everybody in the youth group got baptized at a revival, and I really didn't know why I was getting baptized except everybody else was doing it, and they wanted us to do it, so I did it. That's not why you get baptized. You might as well have just called the titles over them or sprinkled them because that's about as good as you did. As a matter of fact, that's what we call taking God's name in vain, folks. It's a very dangerous place to be. Isn't that right? So we can't be complacent with the things of the flesh. We cannot just lean back and take our ease. The Bible says, woe unto them that take their ease in Zion, that become complacent with the things of this world instead of trusting in the things of God. So be content with what God has given you. Just don't get complacent and say, well, now I don't need God because I've got what God has given me. No, God wants to give you more. God wants to bless you more, but you're going to have to keep your hand in the hand of God. Go to Haggai, the first chapter, verse number one. Here the children of Israel are coming out of bondage, and they have went back to rebuild the city. Brother Pedigo was talking about Nehemiah and them the other day. And this is a little bit different account here of what was taking place. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, thus saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Hmm. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled. You are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. 
Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon the labor of the hands. Haggai is sent from the Lord to prophesy to the people of Israel. They went back to their homeland to rebuild. And they get back, and you know what took place? There were those that came to the king and said, we need to put a stop to the building of the city. Jerusalem can't be rebuilt again because if it's rebuilt, it's going to now bring hurt to your kingdom. It was destroyed once for a reason. That's the things that they were telling them. And if you allow them to continue to build, it's going to bring hurt to your kingdom again. The king sent word until I send another decree no more building in Jerusalem. It's got to stop right now. And that stopped them from building. Here was the problem. How many knows when you stop something, it's hard to get it restarted? Well, they say a, a body in motion tends to stay in motion, and a body at rest tends to stay at rest. You ever come in the house after a long day at work and sit down? You say, I'm just sitting here for five minutes. I'm just sitting here for ten minutes. I'm just going to rest my eyes, and then I'm going to get up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've had some of you tell me, I sat down, Pastor Riggs, I, I'm sorry I missed Wednesday night, but I sat down and I came in from work, and the next thing I know I woke up, and it was 7.30. I've had people tell me that. It's easy to do. Matter of fact, if I'm not careful on Wednesday nights, I try not, if I go home, sometimes I come straight from the office, but if I go home, I try, Brother Paul, not to sit down. I have a few things to do and try to get out the door because if I sit down, it's harder to get going again. There's a lot of times you can ask Kim, I'd come in from work, and she'd say, what are you getting ready to do? And I'd say, if I stop and eat dinner right now, I'll not get the grass cut, and I've got to get the grass cutter. I've got to do this, or I've got to do that, because it's easier for me just to keep going than it is to stop and to start over again. Well, that's what happened here. They were stopped because an enemy king and because there were people that discouraged them from continuing in the work, and they stopped the work, Brother Paul. And now when it was time to go back to work, the people said, well, it's not time. We don't have time to do it now. They had become complacent. It says here they were living in their sealed houses. They were living in their dwelling. It was okay. They had time, Sister Beth, to build their house. They just didn't have time for the house of God. Uh-oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Got time for everything else. I just don't have time for the Lord. Not only do we live like we don't need his help, a lot of times people live like they don't need him. And they may not say this, but they live like they don't need you. Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Church, I never want to live like I don't need God and I don't need the body of Christ in my life. I need God and I need the body of Christ in my life. Don't you? You're here tonight, so I believe you feel that way too. They said, well, it's not time. Hey, guys said, but you're living in your homes. You had time to fix your house, and the house of God lays waste. And because of that, what did he say? He said, you're going you're gonna to sow much and bring in little. You're going to eat, and you're never going to have enough. You're going to drink and not be filled. You're clothed but you're not going to be warm. You're going to earn money, but it's never going to be enough because you're going to put it in a bag with holes in it. What's he saying? 
How many's ever gotten a raise? And you're like, whoo, I needed that raise because I needed that extra bit of money. That extra bit of money comes in, and not long before you're saying, boy, I need another raise. Because it seems like the more I get, the more I spend. Kim and I have talked about that many times. Sister Brock, we're like, you know, if we had the bills we had when we first got married but made the money that we make now, but that isn't the way it goes, is it? Because now that you made a little better money, you can have a little nicer car. Maybe you live in a little nicer house. Maybe you fix up that house. Sister Kim and I have, uh, have had a problem with our fireplace. Right, Kim? It started deteriorating. It had only been around for 30 years. The guy come to work on it, he said, wow. He said, most people only get about five years out of that. And we stretched it to 30 years. We're, we're, we've been pretty good about that, most things. But they finally had to come out and do some work on it. And they took the fire brick out on the inside and replaced that a few weeks ago. And the cap on top had rusted really bad. And the wood around it was deteriorating. So they... The cap wasn't ready yet when they come to do the fire brick. And he told Kim, he said, you don't have to be at home when I come back to do that because it's all on the outside. And if you're not here, we can still work and da-da-da-da-da. So Kim said yesterday after work, you know, she was taking a five-minute close your eyes. She said her and Carson was sound asleep. And she said, much to her surprise, Arose such a clatter. <laughs> it wasn't that guy on the chimney, but it was TJ's chimney company up on the chimney. Beating and banging. Stopped, caused a commotion. Woke her up, scared her to death. But you got to fix things every now and then, don't you? Brother Paul, sometimes you get locked out of your house. You got to break the door down. Muscles, look at that, muscles. We had to fix the lock. Had to fix some things to the door to make it work right again, right? Things got to be fixed every now and then. So we think, well, I've got money. Everything's good. It says here you're earning money and putting, in a, putting it into a bag with holes in it. It's never going to be enough unless we put God first. How many has ever, ever needed something and you prayed, and you were faithful to God, and all at once, it showed up out of nowhere. That's the opposite of what Haggai is telling them. Here he's saying, you're going to earn the money, and you're going to have nothing to show for it, because you're not putting God first. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He said, go up and bring down wood, and start working on the house of God again. Church, we may not have to work on this house, this building, this 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 structure. But church, we need to continually work on this building. We need to continually, amen, work and allow God to make us what he wants us to be. But let's remember in that journey, how many loves living for the Lord? Loves walking with God. Amen. Then don't get outside of God and become complacent, but also don't try to step into places God doesn't have for you yet. David was anointed king, and what did he do? He go up and knock Saul off the throne. What did he do after, after David was anointed? What did he do? Anybody remember what he did right after he was anointed king? Went right back out and worked on the field with the sheep, just like he was doing before. You know why? Because he had been anointed, but it wasn't his time yet. So many times we try to step outside of the will of God. When it's not our time yet. Because we're not content with where God has put us. And then we become complacent in our abilities or in our talents or in our desires. You see the difference tonight? I know we think of complacency of just sitting back and take it easy. But sometimes we become complacent with being able to try to do it ourselves, But not trusting and being content with the godliness that God wants us to have, that God wants us to possess. One last place. Go to Luke 12. Go back to Luke 12. But 
just above where we read earlier. If you go back to verse 15, And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. How many knows a lot of times we don't possess those things, they possess us? We got to have it, we got to have it, we got to have it. We're coming into a time of the year right now where there is going to be a lot of giving and a lot of receiving, and there's going to be a lot of people that are thankful, but there's going to be a lot of people that are not thankful because they're not going to get what they wanted. Because I got to have the latest and the greatest, and there was a commercial out here a while back. A guy bought, like, whatever computer was supposed to be. I don't remember the computer Brother Caleb, 560 or whatever it was, and he's walking in his house. He's got the box, and he looks over at his neighbors, and they're getting a delivery, and it was computer 565, and he's like, I haven't even got it plugged in, and it's already out of date, right? Got to have that latest cell phone that's come out. Doesn't matter that it costs you 15 What's a cell phone cost now? 1,500 bucks for a cell phone. Remember when we paid a quarter and we were mad about that? <laughs> Like I said, these are pay phones. Don't be mistaken. $1,500 buy a phone. And then what they charge you a month. Think about that on top of it. But here it says the things that we think we possess. Let's say it that way. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pour, pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool this night. Thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He said, I don't need to do anything. I've got so much, I'm just going to sit back and take it easy. I'll just build bigger barns because look at what I've done. The Lord said, it doesn't matter what you've done. Your soul is going to be required of you. And then, who is this going to belong to? Paul telling Timothy, tell the people to be content in godliness. Not to lean to the things of the world. Not to trust in the things of the world. Pastor's telling you tonight, through the Lord, trust in the things of God. Believe in the things of God. And hold on to those things. Don't always be looking for, the grass is not really greener. You ever seen an old horse or an old cow, and they got their head stretched out as far as they can through the fence, nibbling on some little stub of grass on the other side of the fence while they got a big hay pile behind them because they think what's out there is better than what's in here. Let me tell you something. There's nothing better out in the world than what, than what God has for you. Don't trust in the things of the world. It's going to fail. It's going to come of naught. But be content in godliness. Live in that place. And know that if I put my trust in God, He'll never leave me nor forsake me. He'll provide for me when it seems like nothing's going to... I've had those things happen. I've had stuff show up when I had no idea it was coming. I remember one time Kim and I, we was low on money. And I knew there was supposed to be a check coming, but I didn't know when, and I especially didn't think it was going to come that soon. And sure enough, went to the mailbox, and there that check was in the mail, right on time. We could say that over and over tonight, how many times God has done that. God lays it on somebody's heart to walk across the church and to slip you a $100 bill and say, I don't know why, but the Lord told me you might need this this week. Come on. Right on time. How many knows he's an on-time God? Be content in the things of God. Don't get complacent with the things of the world because complacency, the end is destruction. But I believe there's peace when we can have 
contentment. Because we can be satisfied with where we are right now, knowing that the next step is only going to bring something better and something sweeter. I'm talking about in the Lord. And the next step is going to take me to something sweeter and something greater. But that's not going to be the case if I try to trust in the things of the world. Because the deeper I get into the things of the world, the deeper I get in the things of the world. And we know the mess that there is out there. But church, we sang a while ago about falling in love with him. And I said it. I do. We need to keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Be content in God tonight. Amen. And hold on to those things that are good. Let's stand. Praise the Lord. Invite somebody out Sunday morning for Sunday school. Everybody come out, and we'll have Sunday morning and Sunday night. Kind of been a mixed, a mixed bag of services the last few weeks, but we will have Sunday morning and Sunday night this week. So invite somebody out for Sunday school, and let's have a great time. Don't forget, Friday is our day of prayer, so everyone uh, be spending some extra time in prayer on Friday. Amen. And pray, as we said a while ago. We're going to see a lot of family in the next couple of weeks. We're going to see a lot of people Amen. Out and about. And uh, let's share the love of God with them, can we? Amen. Brother Leite, dismiss us in a word of prayer, brother. Amen and amen. Shake hands and be friendly. Invite somebody out now. Praise the Lord.